Ahoy there, Captain Benzi here, coming at you with another video for Warhammer Odyssey. In today's video, I wanted to have a look at surviving your first day in the Warhammer world as you take your first intrepid steps into Marienburg City, which class is going to fit you best, what should you do once you get the game started, how does it all work, and give you a brief introduction to things like the user interface and the shop, just to explain how monetization etc works, because of course, these are the questions that most people are going to be asking on day one. Now, if I do forget anything in this video, please let me know in the comment section down below. I can always do a part two or come back and revisit it and do it all from scratch. But basically, this is kind of my taking your first steps in the game guide. I know a lot of you folks have been interested in this game. I am <laughs> getting into it gradually. It's taking a bit of time with Ebecos and that around as well. But I want to be making Warhammer Odyssey content. So if there's something you want to see, if you, there's a particular part of Warhammer Odyssey you want me to explain or go into, I will be doing doing some character guides, looking into the backstory of Marienburg and the various different classes, the gods and that that are mentioned, all that kind of thing in future videos as well. But for today, as I said, we're just going to talk about getting started. So if you do enjoy this video, let me know by hitting like on it, sub to the channel for more Warhammer Odyssey videos further down the line, and let me know what topics you want to see me cover in future videos. If you do want to help support this channel, you can join us on Patreon, and there is a Redbubble merchandise store to check out as well. That said and done then, let's talk about your first couple of steps. Now, obviously, the very first thing you're going to need to do in Warhammer Odyssey is to create a new character, and that usually involves you also choosing which of the uh, different servers that you're going to be on. Now, because I was playing back in the beta for a short while, I've mainly been on Tal. I do, as you can see here, have characters on the other servers as well, but Tal is where I am currently based at home. This is where I will be setting up our regiment, and once I figure out the full details on that, and I've got a couple of different characters already rocking there, ready to go. I've deleted quite a few characters over time, just sort of taking them up to about level 10, level 12, then deleting them and trying the other ones, because originally you only have two character slots. This third character slot, which I'm going to be showcasing here, ultimately comes from buying from the shop. It does require real-world currency to do that, and we'll have a look at that more later. Now, when you're playing an MMORPG like Warhammer Odyssey here, you need to just understand the three different types of class. First of all, you have tanks. Tanks are the guys who stand at the front. They take a lot of damage. They don't tend to have as much capability at dishing out damage, but they are there to soak up the enemy's hits. They tend to have very high survivability, but not much in the way of damage themselves. Second up, you have DPS, which stands for damage per second. These are the guys who actually are the damage dealers in the party. If you're, you know, the tank stands at the front and holds the enemies in place, the DPS are the ones actually hitting them and whittling down their health bars. Thirdly and finally, of course, there are the healers, and a healer's primary job is to keep the rest of the party alive, and it is going to be important in Warhammer Odyssey as you go through the quests that you will probably need to end up grouping up with a party that contains two or more of those different classes. Of course, you can go double DPS, and for certain encounters and missions that will be fine, but as things progress, you do start to need a tank to stand at the front of it, a healer to keep everyone alive, and a damage, uh, damage dealers to actually take things apart. So, if we were to look at the different classes here, first of all, we have an Archmage. The Archmage is a magic user. Obviously, they are High Elves, based from the island of Ulthuan, um, and exploring the city of Marienburg, and they come in two different versions. You get the Master of Heavens, which are damage dealers. These guys cast spells at a distance. There's some good AoE and um, multiple target damage spells in there, along with the standard one-on-one -on -one damage spells. Plus, you also have the capability of going Master of Life as a healer, standing at the back and keeping your party alive. Now, it is worth trying to decide which of those two you would go for at the start, because it is difficult to respec. It does cost to respec between different things, and you do only have one spec. It's not like, say, World of Warcraft, where you can have two different specs that you switch between at whim. Second up then for the elves, we have the Shadow Warrior. Now the Shadow Warrior is a pure damage dealer. There are two different ways that it can deal damage, but both versions are straight up damage. You're not going to be tanking or healing as a Shadow Warrior. Now you have Path of the Veiled Arrow, which is all about uh, standing at distance and shooting things with your bow, and Path of the Silent Blade is all about sneaking, turning yourself invisible, getting behind enemies, or sometimes avoiding them altogether. But either way, you are straight up a pure damage dealer if you're going as a Shadow Warrior. 
Now for the dwarves, again there are two types. First of all, we have the Slayer. Slayers are disgraced dwarves who are basically on a mission to try and die a noble death to get their honor back. They dye their no, they dye their hair and their beards orange, though you can build a slayer with different color hair, as you'll see in a moment. Um, but ultimately, they're there to try and die a glorious death in battle, which is why they don't particularly wear much in the way of armor. Now, curiously, despite the fact that they don't wear much armor, these are one of the tank classes. If you go a troll slayer, um, you get a two-handed battle axe, like you can see our guy here in the uh, in, in the graphic massive two-handed battle axe and you're there to taunt the enemies take all the damage yourself and sort of just keep those enemies attacking you or you can go dragon slayer swap the big axe for two smaller axes and go straight up damage the amount of damage that a standard dragon slayer can actually put out is quite terrifying and a troll slayer does take a fair beating himself as well then we have the Engineers, and I've mentioned in a previous video that I absolutely adore these guys' backpacks. I love the graphics and the art style of these, and Engineers are actually one of my favourite classes. I've played these quite a bit and through the beta, and there are two versions here. Now again, you've got one that is mainly just a straight-up simple damage dealer, the Powdersmith. This is all about having big gun blasts, you shoot your enemies from a distance, um, and just deal as much damage as possible, as quickly as possible. And there are some like gadgets um, and multi-target abilities, like scatter shots and things like that that will hit multiple enemies, um, but you are straight up damage. The alternative is the Machine Smith, which as it says here, supports allies using defensive turrets to taunt, debuff and slow enemies. These are really cool in a party. Now they don't necessarily deal as much damage as the Powder Smith, the Powder Smith does have the higher damage abilities, the Machine Smith instead focuses on the idea of helping out the rest of your party. If you've got other people in the group, then your turrets and that are able to assist, and you can actually send tank with a couple of them. There is one particular turret that taunts, um, which you can use as a kind of semi-tank. It's not as good as having a, a warrior priest or a slayer in your party, but it will do the job nicely. You sacrifice some of your power, basically, some of your damage, just to have a little bit of sort of party utility if you're going for the engineer as a machine smith. Then, of course, we have our human classes. First up, the Sigmarite Warrior Priest. And these, again, come in two variants. You've got Order of the Silver Hammer, which uses a... Uh uh, a, a single hammer, single handed hammer and a shield and they are your tanks, they're designed to soak up the hits as best as possible and you have Order of the Cleansing Flame which uses the two handed hammers that you see on the graphics here and is all about the healing. So you get a choice between going tank or healer as a warrior priest, if you do want to go solo questing and thus you know you know want a, a good way of dealing damage then the single handed hammer and shield the tanking build is the best way to do so. They kick out a surprising amount of damage, um, a little bit more than the Slayer I personally found, but that could just be me and how I built the Warrior Priest. Um, I tend to want to go healer with the Warrior Priest, but the tank build isn't bad at all. Very solid, high defense, and kicks out good damage. Finally then, for humans, we have the Witch Hunter. Now these badasses are straight up damage dealers. You've got the Sigmarite Templar, which is all about chaining together skill combos to inflict devastating critical strikes. Um, they, as you'll see, they use things like the crossbows and that, which they can use in close combat as well, um, and sort of chain together into combos, and just it's all about stacking up as much damage as possible, whereas the Sanctioned Hunter is there to use mid-ranged pistol attacks and debilitating bleeds. It's a bit more of a damage over time class, almost. Um, again, you still have close combat, you still have medium range, and both of these, they're not as long range is something like the Shadow Warrior, the Engineer, or the Archmage, but they do have some range capabilities, you're still going to be wanting to hit things with that Sabre. Very cool looking class. I have struggled a little bit with the Witch Hunter in solo play. They definitely benefit in a group because they kick out a lot of damage, but they seem to be a little bit more fragile than some of the other classes out there. Anyway, so in order to showcase how we get started in this, I'm going to go with a Witch Hunter, just because these are an interesting class that I think a lot of people are interested in. Essentially, you go through the character creator here, pick whichever face uh, you like here. I'm going to go with our number five face. Just change the skin colors through. I like a little bit more of a tan. You can add different facial details and things like scarring, age lines, all this kind of thing. I've covered this more in detail in other videos. Basically, design the character as you see fit. Have a quick look and you can zoom out and zoom in by pinching and uh, swiping outwards and so on. 
You can change your hair colour here, which as I said, with a uh, Slayer is a little bit weird, but hey, there we go. You can even change your height if you fancy being a real tall girl, or if you fancy being a little pocket-sized witch hunter. Either way, entirely up to you. Now, I'm just going to hit review here. I'm going to stick with the standard name, though of course you can give your own name to the character, and I would wholeheartedly recommend giving your own name to a character, simply because then that way you get a bit more of a personal feel for it. Now try and keep it sort of somewhat, you know, I personally feel that if you go for a name that's a bit more fitting with the theme and the scenario, like it's it's a really cool little thing. You can kind of get involved in the world a bit more. So calling yourself something here like Petra Caraman is really cool. I've got other characters like Maya Freebudwin um, and other sort of Hilda Gunnarsson and names like that that are based around dwarves or elves or humans, etc. as they are in the Warhammer world. I just find that gets you a bit more invested in the game than Big PT 1993 or whatever you might call yourself otherwise. Um, if there's a big PT 1993 watching this. Sorry, I literally picked that name out of thin air as I was recording this. Now, you will then be asked, would you like to do the tutorial or would you like to skip it? If this is your first character, 100% do that tutorial. I know it sounds a bit sort of like meh doing tutorial content, but it is worth it. You get to go through and understand how the buttons work, get an idea of what your uh, abilities are, understanding how to attack people, how to contact people, how to pick up items, etc. All of that is uh, covered there in the tutorial really quite nicely, um, and it just gives you an idea of what's going on. But once you've completed the tutorial, you're jumped out here in Marienburg in front of Torlek Torveson. Now, you'll have met this guy during the tutorial, and you'll get a bit of the story that's going on. Basically, your party is attacked by beastmen in the Dragfold Forest, and thus you are on your way. Now, when you speak to a quest giver, make sure that you read the quest text here. So here, eyes up, Petra Karaman, some kind of ruckus is kicking off with Jonas Reichlicht at the Gangplank. I reckon he needs our help. Read what is going on. This is a story-driven game, and it is going to get boring real quick if all you're doing is spamming quests over and over again without any con you know, idea of what's actually happening. Now, I've read through these multiple times, so I am going to skip through them, and I'm going to let you guys just kind of get on with it. But when you are in combat here, you can, of, taught, of course, sorry, there we are, you can, of course, tap on different characters, and if you're ta uh, tapping on an enemy, you will get this little bar at the bottom of the screen appear here, where it says Reichsport Looter. You'll see there it's pointing at this guy here, and it then has a number and a skull. Now, these guys here are all apparently level 2, and they are difficulty or challenge rating 1. That's what the skull is. The skull is basically the challenge rating of a target. Be aware that an enemy with three skulls can be a bit of a difficult target to deal with if you're at similar levels. You will probably need a party to take out a three skull opponent. Anyway, as an example here, with the Witch Hunter, I'm going to stand at distance, press the gunshot, and as this guy runs in, I'm then just going to hold the attack button down, and you'll see that we start attacking. And if you can get a full three swing combo off, so one, two, and then three, you see at the top there, I have gained sort of a combat point. Now, these are all different, whether you're a Witch Hunter or a Warrior Priest, they've all got different names, but essentially you use them in the combos. If you see down here where my gun is, it's now got that little circle, it's filled in with gold, that will disappear in a moment. There we are, that combat point has disappeared, and you see now that my gunshot has lost that ability. When when you're looking at your different abilities, you'll find that they all have different things that those additional um, that those additional points there mean. So if you've got those combat points, you can use those to get additional effects off some of your abilities. It's also worth noting that when you talk to certain characters, you might get things here. For example, when we're talking to Torlek, <coughs> excuse me, we have the option of asking about quests or some of the history of Marienburg. So you can learn more about the city from this guy, get an idea of what's going on here bit of character development from Torlek himself. And as we're going forward, this guy is going to jump us and make us do a quest, just to teach us fetch quests in case you hadn't already done the tutorial. Again, here you can tap on other players, you can tap on NPCs, and if you tap on one of these green glowing crates, you can tap the icon, run up to it, and you'll loot that item, which is part of this quest's object objective. And if you've kind of accepted some quests and you're not sure what they're doing, well, that's where you tap the three bars here, the sort of hamburger menu, you can open that up, go 
go to quests and you'll get this little menu come up here which tells you exactly what you're doing. So here I can see that I needed to head north into Reichsport, talk to Rudolf Holmstedt, collect a cargo crate and give the cargo crate to Theo Brandt and you can use this little icon here that I'm tapping to track it or to not track it. I'm going to track it, you can only have one of these active at a time and it shows here on the right hand side of the screen appear payload. I can either, if I tap that arrow, I can come through here but if I try and actually tap the little arrow itself, there we are, we can hide that or reveal it as required. Now obviously I want it revealed because I want to know what's going on here, which quest I'm going for. So we're going to move forward past the little begging guy here and when we get to Theo, we're going to talk to him here. Again, you can read exactly what's going on. You'll get another quest handed to you and so on. Read through all these bits. They are giving you an idea of exactly what's going on here in town. You'll find that as you're doing stuff, you'll start to get little icons on your map. Now, if we look at the map legend, these little red icons with sort of a pin there, looks like a Google Maps pin, are search locations. Basically, go to that point and something will happen. It's usually that you'll be there and someone will talk to you, or there's a particular item that you need to grab, that kind of thing. If you've got the little chest icon, it's a get item. You'll have seen, like with the, uh, the one where I've just picked up a crate off the dock, there'd be a little red icon here on the map saying get an item. Next objective is once you've finished everything that you need to do, you've killed all the enemies you need to kill or you've got all the items you need to get, the little question mark in red is go here to hand it in basically. The red skull will be to kill a knight, uh, an enemy, give item is to hand something to a new person, and inspect of course means there's an item that you need to look at, examine and get the next part of the story. When you're on the map as well, do keep an eye out for the yellow and the blue quests. Blue quests especially, they're the side quests. They can be a little bit like, you know, ugh, side quests, I've got so many of these to do. Do them. Seriously, do them. You get a lot of experience for doing them. You get a little bit more of the history of the world, and some of them do have some really cool rewards as well. And um, you'll also notice that there is this little sort of cart symbol here which are fast travel, and it's often side quests that you have to complete in order to open up new fast travel locations, and trust me, movement in this game is not particularly quick, mounts don't exist at this point in time, you are going to take a long time running from A to B to C to D if you don't open up those fast travel points. It's much quicker if I'm questing all the way up here to just jump down and transport myself straight to Hendrik's favour if I need to get back there, rather than having to take a 10 minute run across town. There are other things as well on this map that we will talk about in a moment once we hit the central town. That's when I'll also have a look at things like what's going on in regards to um, like the monetization here of Warhammer Odyssey. But we're going to kill this guy first because he's part of one of the quests. We have to kill him and his goon. And I'm just going to do this with auto attacks because they're only one star enemies. And well, yeah, it's really not difficult there. Um, unfortunately, it appears that there are three of us here, no one's grouped up, so we're all waiting to kill this different guy here. And if you get that, if you look next to the health bar here at the bottom, you'll see that this guy now has a little, uh, what's it called, like a little targeting reticule, whereas the other guy when I was attacking him had a, uh, had a padlock on him instead. That padlock means that you are attacking an enemy that someone else has already claimed. So if you keep getting that, party up with people. You're all basically doing the same quest, so it's pointless to try and complete, uh, compete with each other to get all of this different loot. Just go ahead, team up, and join each other. Do the quests together, that way you kill the enemy once and everyone gets the credit for it. Now I'm going to take an aside here, just because I really like this little quest here. Confront Horst Radish. Yes, this guy's name is Horseradish. Beyond him as well, the guy be uh, behind him, I think his name is Karl Toffeln, which I believe is German for potato, which I just find hilarious. Like, really well done to the developers for getting that one in there. That's an excellent little name. There we are, yeah, chase down Karl Toffeln. Um, if you're in range, you can just usually tap on the icon as well to talk to someone, and you will start to run towards them natively like that, just natively run in, talk to him immediately. Again, you can read all the extra stuff from these guys, and I do wholeheartedly recommend doing so. Gives you a lot of information about what's going on. Just This is literally about the ninth or tenth time I'm doing this quest line, so yeah, it's kind of a little bit... I, I, I don't want to sit and read through all of this time and time again, but there we go. Now, we are in Central Reichsport here, and I love this area. That is such a cool area to look at, seeing the statues here. This is, you know, excellent graphics. There's a dueling area here where if you run into the center, you can actually t uh, initiate duels with other players um, just to see who's the best. It's not straight to the death, um, which is pretty cool. 
There we are, let's drop him off at the bank. And now we can talk about the different types of establishments here in Reichsport. Now you'll see on the map, straight away, we have that hand in quest here, which is what I said, it's your next objective. We can talk to this guy and he'll take us on our next quest. It's always worth having the quests that you want to do in your inventory before you log off. That way when you come back on, you know where you are going. Grab them rather than just leaving them uh, as question marks out on your map. And you can see I need to go up here um, and just investigate that particular area. But what are these other symbols on the map here? Well, this one at the top, now in the center of your screen, is a uh, its a post box. It, when you first join the game, you will probably have a mail icon. Um, if you were in the beta, you can run to one of those post boxes, collect some mail and get some cool items from the developers, which will allow you to respec. We then have here the bank. The bank is on the map as this sort of um, vault icon, and that the that will tell you where the bank is. If we tap on our banker and talk to him, basically what this does is it gives you somewhere that you can transfer items into, so they're not in your bag space. Um, and you can put them back here because you do have limited space here. As you can see, 20 more items in my bag and in my vault. Again, it's the same. I can carry 20 items. Now, obviously, if you're never going to use something, the best thing to do is to find a vendor and sell it. But your bag space is limited and there are some items you may want to hold on for future use or to send to other characters, that kind of thing. So that brings us nicely to talking about the in-game shop and how Warhammer Odyssey is monetized. Now, if we look at the sovereigns, which are the coin packs here, you'll see that these go all the way up to £86. And quite frankly, that looks a little bit scary. And I know a lot of people are put off as soon as they see that you can drop 86 quid on this game instantly on day one. But you really, really don't need to. Now, that's how you buy sovereigns. Sovereigns are only available through real world money, and you can use them here to buy various different things. Now, a Tome of Shifting Focus allows you to reallocate your stat points. A retraining manual allows you to reset your allocated ability points. We'll talk more about those in a moment. You then have a regiment banner, which allows you to create a regiment, which are like guilds or clans, or I suppose if in Eve Echoes terms, if you're coming here from Eve Echoes, they are your corporations. You then have the ability to add extra character slots. Um, so you saw at the beginning, I've got three character slots here on Tal. I only had two in the others. This only adds on for that particular um, for that particular service. If you're on Tal and you buy a character slot, that doesn't go on to Manal um, or the other servers either. You can then upgrade your backpack with additional five slots. And the first of these is 25. The second one is then 50. They do increase in cost as you go. And the bank expansion as well um, is available there if you want to have more space in your bank. Now, whereas it's only five for your bag, it is 10 for the bank. And I'll be completely honest, I've never needed to do this. Whilst I was actually running through the beta, my standard backpack and bank was more than enough. There were some times where I had to make little, like sort of, mm, I'm not sure I want to get rid of that, but it never really came back to bite me in the ass. So getting one backpack expansion, maybe one bank expansion is going to be more than enough. Now, the next thing that you can buy as well are these experience drafts and experience elixirs. Now, these, if you read through them, give you an increase in the EXP gained by defeating enemies for five minutes. And again, you can do this here with uh, the uh, infused there's a 100% increase for 5 minutes, and the elixirs do kind of the same thing, but for 15 minutes, and are a bit more expensive. Now, I don't really rate these for a couple of different reasons. One, the quests are actually developed on a fairly standard curve. If you're questing as normal, you're probably, you know, you're, if you're doing all of the side quests, you will meet the next level of quests by the time you reach them. So, why would you want to be at level 13 when you're now getting the level 10 quests kind of thing? The only reason I can see for doing these is if you've got an alt that you want to level up. Like, for example, perhaps you've been leveling up a Slayer, you get him all the way up to level 20 and you're with your friends and you want to do level 20 content, but they really suddenly need a healer. And you go, actually, I wouldn't mind playing a healer, so you re-roll an Archmage or a Warrior Priest. Then I can understand that you might want to grab some of these, and when you're questing, you chug those down and use them to level up that little bit faster. I really don't rate them. I think it's a way of skipping through the game, um, which it's nice to have, I guess, but definitely not that useful. And one of the problems with Warhammer Odyssey at this point in time is that there isn't all that much content once you sort of hit endgame. It's going to take you a while to get endgame, so enjoy that journey. Don't rush it. Don't rush it or you're going to hit endgame and find that there's nothing left for you to do because you just burnt your way through all the content. Take your time. Treat this as an experience, not as a race. There is a lot more content on 
on the way. The developers have been dropping sneaky hints of all kinds of crazy stuff on its way, but just don't rush it. I personally wouldn't use these drafts and elixirs unless you're leveling alts. Now, the Gilders items, because you'll notice that some of the Sovereign packs here give you Gilders as well, and when you buy these things, like for example the character slot and 200 Gilders, you can then use these to buy the Tome of Shifting Focus, the retraining manual, and those drafts as well. Now, Gilders, as you can see, are a little bit more commonplace. You get these a bit more throughout the game, um, and they're just useful there if you want to use those respecs. So, on the subject of respecs, while we're standing out here in the middle of Marienburg, not really doing much, you can see that as I reach level 1, um, sorry, level 2, I've got an action point available. So if I tap on my character here at the top, or you can go in via the standard menu, you come to character. Now, when you level up, let's also just equip that ring. When you level up each time, not only do you get new actions, you also get your new stats. Now, you can tap on each stat and hold it, and it'll give you an idea of what they do in relation to your particular class. So for a warrior priest here, sorry, a... Uh, uh, a Witch Hunter here, a weapon skills point, increases the physical damage dealt, whereas focus slightly increases the physical damage dealt. It's not as much. Focus isn't as important. Accuracy increases the chance that your attacks will hit, etc, etc, etc. Now, you can build this manually. You can sit here and put the points in as you want them, or you can just hit auto-assign and then submit. Now, quite frankly, if it's your first time through, auto-assigning up to the point where you choose your path is not a bad way to go. But if you know straight off the bat that you want to be a healer or a tank or whatever, you can read through those stats and figure out exactly which ones you want. On the other side of things, we then have the action points. As you level up, you first of all gain new abilities. So here at level 1, we've got the quick shot, which is the gun shot we saw, and I've got one action point which I can use to improve any of my abilities. Now here at this point in time, I've only got that for quick shot, so I can either use it now, which I may as well, because quick shot, quite frankly, is... Sorry, oops, assigned to button, put it on that one. There we are, which I may as well, because Quick Shot is one of those abilities that as a Witch Hunter you're pretty much using the entire time. But for example, once we hit Mark of the Heretic, you can start putting points in there to increase uh, the abilities there, like reducing the cooldown or reducing energy costs. You get a choice here um, later on at level 6, whether we go for a Flourishing Strike or press the Advantage. These are different skills, you can read through these, and again, you'll be able to put action points in there. And it's usually 1 point for the level 2 ability, 2 points for the level 3 ability, 3 points for the level 4 ability, that kind of thing, so you do occasionally want to save up your action points. So if you do find that you come all the way down here, you go down past Press the Advantage, you get Veteran here at level 9, and then you decide, oh actually, Press the Advantage was cool, but I'd rather have Flourishing Strike, you can jump back to the shop, and we can have a look at both the Tome of Shifting Focus there, which is the stat point allocation, or the retraining manual, and that allows you to reallocate your ability points so you can choose new abilities, and where you've put those particular ability points to make them better. As a next point, this little icon over here on the map is our blacksmith. Now, your weapons do have durability. If you take damage in combat, if you die especially, your weapons lose durability, as um, does your armor, and as you're taking hits and swinging it will as well. So you can talk to a blacksmith, go to equipment repair, and you can repair all equipped items for a small amount of coin. It's well worth doing this every time you pass a blacksmith, get into the habit of repairing every time you see one. There is nothing worse than being in the middle of a quest and suddenly all of your, uh, all of your stuff disappears. Now here you see I've got a fast point discovered. I can actually go to Troop of Fish here, quit stalling, take a look at this quest. This is a, uh, as you can see, it's blue. It is a side quest. We can grab this. This is well worth doing here. Very, very simple quest. We've just got to run across, look at the stall, go back to Troop of Fish, and tell him that that's done. And then, bam, that fast point is now unlocked. We can now actually travel between that. We then up here have the auction house. This, of course, is where you can sell any gear that you don't want, or you can buy any gear that you do want and haven't been able to find. Again, if we go into the shop, one of the items that you can buy with Gilders is, sorry, not with the Gilders, Sovereign items, um, is auction house slots. And you can buy up to 17 of these already. You do start with some slots, but if you find that actually spending a lot of time on the auction house is something you're really enjoying, then buy some extra slots there as well. Ultimately, I've spent about £10 on this game so far, and that's given me more than enough of what I need in regards to monetization. Um, I personally went for the, uh, the backpack expansion um, and the bank expansion. I've still got some guilders left over that you can use to buy other things as well. Of course, make sure you start to learn where your class trainers are. These guys are really useful because they're going to be able to, uh, opposite them, you usually have someone who is given, uh, able to sell you some of your gear. Now, I've still got to actually wait to uh, unlock this here. 
you've got to do your little quest, which is just showcasing um, how to do this. So again, we go into the character menu, because we've got a new ability now. Here we are, learn the action. I'm going to assign that to a button, I'm going to put it here on the corner. Um, I'm going to leave the action point for the time being, I'm going to auto assign my points, because I'm a nice low level, and we're going to hit the mark. Then we're going to charge in and do just a couple of attacks to showcase how that all works. And you see I'm building up those uh, combat points. I can then use the gun, bam, dispense a combat point, etc, etc. Now if I tap off, I can then go and talk to this girl, finish the training there, and this will be a different quest for each of the different classes, of course. Then you can talk suddenly to the vendor who is going to sell some interesting gear here, which is a great way to get started. All of the starting classes do have this. Um, getting that novice gear there, a great way just to give yourself a bit more power early on in the game. Finally then, as you start to quest, as I said, you will start to meet other players, and there are numerous different things you can do here. Up here in the top left, you've got your sort of, your communication panel, I'm going to call it. First of all, in the middle, you have a load of different sort of, uh, uh, different emotes, couldn't think of the word, like dancing, etc. This is an MMO, so of course there are silly dances for every single character and every single class. Plus we've got things like laughing, pointing, and you can just get on with that kind of thing. And um, if, like me, I used to roleplay a lot on World of Warcraft servers, and um, that's pretty cool for me. But you can also just go into local message here, straight away type, and that'll be like a, a simple say. Anyone in the very close vicinity will be able to hear that. Or if you tap on the main thing itself, we can go shout, which will hit everyone in this particular area. Group, which will um, talk to anyone that I'm partied with, and we can look for players. In fact, you can see, if I go into area, this is a full list of other different players in the area, and some of these are in purple there, that they've joined a, uh, a, a regiment that they've created, and I'm going to be creating a regiment here on Tal, so if you are looking to play the game, come join us on Tal. Same with friends there as well, if we tap off. Your regiment will allow you to obviously talk to everyone in the regiment, and system is, well, you can't message here, but it's where it's, uh, you're getting all the information here, like, you know, you're, uh, like you've done so much damage, or this has worn off, or you've used that ability. Now, ultimately, that's all you really need to know to get started. Um, when I actually get the, uh, the, the, the the regiment up and running, it will, of course, be called the Catskull Cartel. So if you do want to come and join us, that's where you'll find us. I do intend, as I said, to do a couple of videos on the different classes, a bit of their history in the Warhammer world. You know, who are the Witch Hunters? What is a Witch Hunter? What's a Warrior Priest? Who on Earth is this Sigmar guy that I keep hearing about? What is Marienburg's city? What is the Dragwald Forest? Who are Beastmen? What are these weird chaos things that I keep hearing about? All that kind of stuff I will probably cover in future videos as well. Just let me know what you're interested in. If you're playing this game, let me know how you're finding it right now. As I said, the content is a little bit sparse at Endgame, but the journey to Endgame is great fun with a pretty interesting story to take you all the way up. So I am looking forward to drawing some new characters, joining some of you guys in, uh, in and around Marienburg, and having some fun. Anyway, folks, thank you very much for watching right the way to the end. Again, let me know if you think I've missed anything, if there's any points that you think are absolutely vital for new players to learn, that kind of thing. Let me know in the comment section down below. Otherwise, folks, happy sailing, and see you in the Warhammer world!